family and friends, strangers and allies, and everyone, no matter where you are from. Welcome to Global Entrepreneurship Week, the time of the year where we are here to celebrate and contemplate what it means to be an entrepreneurial thinker. And this is the Entrepreneur Week founded by the Foundation for Economic Education, where you are going to be hearing from many different personalities and entrepreneurs on how you can unleash creativity in your life. Everywhere I go, when I have conversations about entrepreneurship, there's always someone who thinks or feels, but I don't know anything about business, or I've never been on the cover of Forbes magazine. But something that we want to make clear to you this week is that being an entrepreneur is more than anything else a state of mind. It's a way of looking at the world. It's a way of approaching life. And today, we are going to kick things off by talking with you about how to get inspired and how to stay inspired. For many people, being motivated is a very fleeting thing. It comes and it goes like the cycles of the weather. But we want to help you learn how to be the kind of person that can manufacture your own inspiration, be the kind of person that can sustain motivation no matter what's going on in the world around you. So you're gonna hear from some great doers and thinkers, and you're gonna learn how to do both of those things. If you have questions along the way, you have a question tab that you can submit your questions in. When we get to the end and we have our panel discussion, you will be able to submit those questions. You can submit them all throughout, and we will answer those questions for you. So don't hold back. If there's anything that you wanna know, everything is fair game, as long as the information is something that makes you better. All right, first up, to talk with you about getting inspired and staying inspired is none other than Ed Lattimore. Ed Lattimore, one of the things we mentioned is he's not only a former heavyweight boxer and a chess player and an author and an entrepreneur, but he's also a physics student as well. So for those of you who think that being a Renaissance man is a lost art, Ed Lattimore is a guy that's bringing it back and showing us how to not only be well-rounded, but how to dominate you know, in our niches um, and how being well-rounded does not conflict with those two things, with, with that. So give it up for Ed Lattimore, how to be a heavyweight in your own life. Ed, thanks for joining us, brother. Hey, thank you for having me. And this is a very interesting event, very interesting experience because I never in a, ma in a, in a thousand years imagined that I would be delivering a speech via the internet and you're used to speaking in front of people and standing on stage and when you do these things there are no distractions or anything to bother you but at any given point in time my cat could decide to jump up and join me or let me know that he's hungry or anything uh crazy could go on but hopefully this would be a great talk and a great speech and i'll be able to deliver some great information to you without the interference of my cat so i want to start off by by saying uh, first wherever you are in the world uh, good morning good afternoon good evening and a lot of you are here because you're interested in entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship was always this idea uh, in my mind that i actually had a negative association with i thought entrepreneurship was just this thing that you would say you were or that you were working on instead of having an actual job. That's how brainwashed that we we become typically by the system. We think that any way to break out of the system is bad and any label that we put on ourselves as kind of rebels to that system is, is not good. Certainly if you are indoctrinated the way they want you to be. Along the way though, in my involvement in, in boxing, I, I had a mind shift. And to understand and appreciate this mind shift, you have to understand where I started. I'm from a very poor neighborhood. I grew up as an at-risk youth. I fit every single uh, label or every single category, you know, born to a single mom in the public housing system. I was on welfare, all of those things. And and one of the, the, the cool things that happened somehow, some way, is that I was a good student. And by being a good student, that meant that I could regurgitate the facts and I could do the work and I had a decent enough temperament to sit there and work through class. And what happens when you're a good student or an above average student is you tend to develop a fixed mindset 
what that is is you start to identify with your accomplishments more than your process for accomplishing for me i didn't realize this until i encountered math and when i encountered math i was like wow this is something extremely difficult that i can't just regurgitate and memorize so i'm going to uh, leave it behind and people see a degree in physics and anyone who has studied physics understands uh, that you need to have an extraordinary level of math uh, medical ability to do it. They think that I'm joking when I say I was terrible at math, but I wrote a post on my website a while back where I went and I dug up my old transcript to show just how terrible I was at math. My only, my highest grade in math was a B I got in geometry and then everything else after that, I struggled to get C's, a lot of D's uh, and some E's on the report card. I don't know if they still go out E's or if it's F's or whatever, but the point is I was not doing too well. So I gave up on anything related to math in my life and I had enough awareness to know that the best jobs came with mathematics. So I just figured I would, would figure something else out. Uh, and there would be no math in my life or anything related to that. Uh, I, I let that go. I graduated from high school and, and forgot all about this incident until I started boxing. And when I first started boxing, you know, I, I wasn't a natural athlete whatsoever. Uh, in fact, I was kind of terrible. I wish I could pull up the videos and you could see my footwork was non-existent. My defense was, uh, it was okay. And I could throw heavy punches, but it was more like because I was just a big person, I didn't understand what to do. But I really wanted to box and that desire to do a thing. I wanted it so badly that I put the time in. I, I grinded, as they say. I was in the gym all the time and I practiced and I studied film and every teacher I could put myself around, I sucked up the knowledge. I took the losses and learned from them. I didn't let the losses beat me down or push me back or make me lose my, my taste for improvement for the sport. And, and a funny thing happened. I started boxing at 22. Uh, and 22, that, that's ancient. I mean, that, that in, in boxer years, that's starting when you're like uh, a dinosaur or just starting as a, as, an, as, an, as a senior citizen. There's no usual way things, good things happen when you start that late. Well, I started that late at, at 22. And after a year, I was a little better. After two years, a little more. And by year three, some interesting things started happening in my amateur career. I win the state title for National Golden Gloves. And for those of you who don't know, in the National Golden Gloves, you're divided by states and you win your state and you go to face the national, uh, you go to the national tournament to face the other champions from, from the state. So I won my state in 2011. And then from there I went to nationals and I, and I had a good enough showing to get some eyes on me to get a sponsorship for me to go and eventually win an actual national title at another tournament and end up at the men's national championship, uh, also known as the Olympic trials. And these things came together and I kept getting better. I kept getting a little better and I kept moving along and slowly but surely I, I went from someone who had no athletic ability to someone who had heaps of talent it would seem but there was no talent it never it never felt that way to me it felt like something that i had to work for and along the way i realized the boxing wasn't going to be there forever and i said okay i have to do something i'm good at this but i have to do something i have to prepare for the future and in preparation for the future i decided i would go back to school and i said i'm going to go back to school for physics but that meant I had to face the demon known as math. But something different happened. Something along the way occurred to my mindset. I was no longer fixed. I no longer thought that the ability that was given to me for math, I was stuck there with it. Because of what happened to me in my life with boxing, because I watched myself go from a mediocre novice, someone who realistically should have walked out of the gym in the first month. I stuck around until I was able to achieve some noteworthy things as an amateur and go on to have a decent enough professional career. 
And I said, okay, if I can do that for my body, if I can watch myself go from a nothing to a someone, to a nobody in this sport, to someone with a national title and a national ranking, and I can get paid to do this, if I can do that with boxing, I should be able to do it with math. I mean, how much different can it be? We're punching people in the face in one, I'm punching equations, it's kind of the same thing, I'll figure it out. And that was the attitude I took towards math. And that was the attitude I took towards my degree. And I just put my head down and I kept at it. I just kept making small improvements from the basics, building my way up, figuring this thing out as I went along, but not by myself. Wherever I can get the help, I took it. And I took it earnestly, whether it was from fellow students or if it was from professors or if it was from someone who was not in the same field but had an insight that I could use, I took everything from around me and I used it to make myself better. And eventually I was able to graduate with this degree. Now, there's some really valuable lessons here that I took with me and I poured it over to my entrepreneurial endeavors. And my, my field of entrepreneurship, I write. But really entrepreneurship is just a mindset. It's a mindset where you see something that a lot of other people don't see as valuable or they're not willing to work to extract that value. And you are, you're willing to do that and take it and put it in front of people who do see the value in it, who will spend the money, who will invest the time. And because you have taken it from a position of lower value to a position of higher value, you will reap the change in value. You'll be able to collect a bit of a toll, a tax, a fee, whatever you want to call it. That's what you'll be able to extract as an entrepreneur. And I had done a similar process, a similar transmutation of raw value to myself. I did it to my body with boxing. I did it to my mind with math and physics. So I said, okay, I'm gonna be able to do this with a similar process in entrepreneurship. And that's all it is about. If you can remember that a lot of the time, the only difference between you and someone who is further along in their journey is time and consistency. That's it. You can't do anything about Tom. You can't suddenly speed it up. You can't suddenly jump ahead, at least not right now with the limits in technology. But what you can do is show up and be so invested in getting better and achieving what you're trying to achieve that you put in the grind. You start to grind. You do the work consistently day in, day out. And to do the work that way, you have to not be focused on the outcome. And this is a really weird way of looking at it. When I fought, I people ask me, how was I able to get up and, and make it to the gym every day? Because it's a really miserable, painful life. You, you get punched, you come home, you get punched some more the next day, you come home, you get punched even more. And then that's just practice. Then you go out once a week as an amateur, sometimes twice, depending on the tournament and the region of the country you're in, you go out and you get punched for real and that builds your ranking and then you do the same thing as a professional except not everyone can punch hard. How does one uh, deal with this miserable life? Well, you, you're not thinking about the payout because the payout may never come in the sense of how you're expecting it to look, whether that be a massive pay-per-view fight or a, the a, adoring fans or massive endorsement deals, these things may never show up. What do you do it for? You do it for something that you get out of it that can't be taken away from you. Why do we do entrepreneurship? Sure, the money is a big deal, but many of us, we can't even imagine selling our time to someone else to invest in their dream, to invest in their product, to invest in their projects. For us, we would rather, I'll give it to you in a quote, actually, a quote that really stuck out to me to the point where I had it, uh, I've been quoting it and sharing it with anyone who will listen because it sums up our mentality. Entrepreneurs are the only people who will work 80 hours to avoid working 40. And when you understand that, when you take that mentality and you, you seize it, 
You see, for a lot of us, it's not about the money. And if it is ever about the money, you have to remember, the money may not come quickly. It may not ever come at all. I know some guys, they are super content working as employees of a business of one, but it is their own business and they control their time and they control their income. And that's why they do it. You can't take that away from them and you can't dangle it in front of them. You can't dangle a higher salary in front of them because to them, that's that's a fate worse than death. That's a fate worse than failure. That is trading their freedom for money. That's trading their dream for someone else's dream. And we all have to contribute somewhere. I'm I'm never the guy that will tell you that being an employee is a negative thing. We need employees, we need people to maintain the order of society. We need people to do things so we can have the life that we we chase and want. But if you're called to it, if you're really called to it, if you feel it in your bones, you have to take the patient long view of these things. You have to look at it and go, okay, right now I am nothing. Right now I have no ability. I am a beginner. I've failed at everything else. But this, I'm going to stick with this. And I'm going to stick with this because I have no other choice. For me right now, I look at my life and I remember when I was really, really poor. I mean, we're talking like, I don't know if I can get some food, you know, the, the kind of poor where you take your card out and you hope and pray that you're not going to be declined. And this is not just as a child, but as an adult. And when your card runs through and you can buy your groceries, you're like, great. Now, what else can I get before my card and my bank account goes into the negative and they won't let me buy anything? That kind of poor. I've been there. And I look at my life now. I remember when I was poor, the goal, the point of failure was if I had, if I, if I couldn't get a job, if I was stuck there, right? But now the point of failure would be if I had to get a job and nothing's changed. The dream hasn't changed. Why I do it hasn't changed. Because to be honest, if, if there was less money, less anything, what I have is a freedom. And what I have is a freedom was purchased by a consistent effort that came along with changing my mindset from fixed to growth and being willing to be patient and do the work patiently to not rush it and to take the ups, downs, good, bad, but all of it in stride in the process of me maintaining my freedom. So as I wrap this up, one of the things uh, I hope you take from this story that I've given you and this insight into how I think and how I change my mindset and perspective is, is something I tell people all the time. A lot of times in an interview, someone will ask, do you have something to leave uh, all the listeners with that they can think about for later? And I tell them the same thing every time. I say the most powerful belief uh, that you can have is that given enough time, you can learn anything. And what I mean by that is that, you know, you're not going to live forever and there has to be a sense of urgency in all things that you do, right? But that sense of urgency has to come naturally. It has to come as a result of being fired up. It has to come not because you're trying to quickly accumulate a thing, but because you're so excited about the day and you're so excited about the process and the learning and changing how you think and approach the world of being free that you can't wait to get up and do the thing that calls you to do, that you're trying to learn. So whether your entrepreneurial path is writing, whether it is e-commerce, whether it is simply creating art and putting it on Etsy to make a, a side hustle that you feel super fulfilled with, no matter what it is, you have to be patient, you have to take the time, you have to be willing to invest in yourself and in the energy that it, that is required 
to make it for whatever you, you are make whatever it is you're trying to make and if, if you do those things and if you do those things with a mindset that grows along the way then it's impossible to fail because at that point the only real failure is to quit and you won't quit because you love what you do and you love what you're learning i'm at Lattimore, and i hope you got something valuable out of this talk feel free to find me anywhere just type in ed Lattimore. i'm the same person on all things social media my website is the same where i write about these topics and many more that can help you change your mindset and change your life please leave your message brother ed thank you so much man that was a powerful talk you, you got a few minutes for some questions that, that i that we have here oh sure so we've got a lot of people uh, curious about uh, picking your brain on a few things. So I'm going oh to, to throw some your way. <laughs> All right. So one is, what if you can't find anything that you really love doing? People say everyone has a talent and they just have to find it. But how exactly do you find it? Okay. I have a great answer for that. So uh, at least, you know, I think it's a great answer. Hopefully you do too. So there, there is an infinite number of things you can do, uh, and you don't have all the time in the world to do all of them. So how do you narrow that down? And then from there, ideally, there is something that you're good at. So how do you narrow that down, first of all? Well, you look at the things, you know, think back to when you were oh, maybe 10, 11, or 12, somewhere in that age range. That's that, that point where you have autonomy but not enough responsibility to take away from you doing things for fun. That's when you can, you know, if you're an outdoors a kid, you can go outside and be outdoors all the time. If you like video games, you can play a lot of video games and there's no real penalty. Think about what you did for fun at that point, like what you did for fun and then think about what you naturally have an interest and skill in. Somewhere in there, right? And, and everyone has something uh, they're at least not bad at. I'm not saying you're going to be the best, but there, there's some area in your life where you have a comparative advantage, uh, I something you do better than everything else. Maybe not better than other people, but certainly it is your natural uh, maxed out skill. There is some overlap, whether it be directly, you know, let's just say, you know, for me, it was it was video games. I lo And more specifically, I loved playing RPGs. I love the story and the element of them. And I said, man, if I could do that, I, I always wanted to be a writer, okay? And then I, I actually gave up on my dream of writing for a long time because I got discouraged. I thought I wasn't a good writer. You know, school will really do that to you. And then I came back and I said, I'm going to try this again. But this time I, I had that mindset that I spoke about where I said, I'm just going to keep at this. And, uh, you know, whatever happens, happens. And I just kept getting a little sharper and a little sharper. But I was enjoying myself because it was it was me writing, okay? And I didn't start out, I still don't think I'm, I'm any good. I know objectively I'm a lot better than I was uh, four or five years ago. But it was never about being the best in the world, right? It was about being the best writer I could be. And writing is what I enjoyed. So you have to find that thing that you enjoyed as a kid because our interests don't change that much. So think about what you enjoyed and then figure out where the profitable intersection or potentially profitable intersection uh, is. And, and when, you, when you find that, just start hammering away. And I guarantee you somewhere along the age range of 10 to, to 14, uh, you'll find out what your like passion naturally is. And every kid is different than this way. And it's so cool when you when you look at it, like if you, they ask a question, well, what would you be doing right now if you were doing what you wanted to grow up to do? And a lot of times it's what you what you were really starting to get interested in right at those those preteen years. So I hope that that helps and points you in a direction. If you, you start thinking about those things and then try to find the profitable kind of peripheral overlay or intersection, you should be on a pretty good path that way. That's excellent. All right. The next one is, have you done things that you don't want to do for a long period of time just to reach your goals? <laughs> ah, man, uh, I'm going to I'm going to keep I'm going to keep this quote PG friendly and then I'll, I'll elaborate. Um, uh, someone once said that that choosing your path in life is all about choosing which uh, crap sandwich you're willing to eat. 
all all things worthwhile have a crap element uh, to them. In other words, nothing is 100% enjoyable. In, and, and in reality, the more ambitious your goal, the less enjoyable, I put that in air quotes, uh, parts there will be to achieving what you want. The way you deal with this, because I feel like the question is kind of like, you know, not, yeah, I mean, the, the, the direct answer is yes, I've done things that I didn't really want to do for long periods of time uh, to reach what I want to do. But to to advise on that, uh, if you're having any kind of trouble in that, that arena, you have to get, I was just telling someone this today, you have to remember uh, you, you, that, that you have said goal and then uh, eliminate your emotions toward that. Like when you are, because that's what motivation is. That's an emotion and to a lesser extent, so is inspiration and somehow, and they're, they're a little dangerous in that if you only work when you feel like, when you feel motivated, uh, you're not going to do much work, right? Uh, likewise, right? And this is the other part that people don't think about. If even if you go into a thing anticipating it being difficult, you're going to feel resistance naturally. If you go into a thing anticipating it being exciting, um, it, it'll carry you initially and then you'll be like, this is not nearly as fun as I thought it was going to be. Maybe I'll go do something else. All right. And we also have the other problem is if you're, you're doing a thing to escape a problem, uh, you're, you're doing it, doing it, doing it, and that's your main motivation. And one day you start thinking, this is really hard. Uh, maybe it's not that bad if I just, you know, if, if I gotta gotta pay off that that debt out of pocket. You saying it's not that bad uh, if I gotta if I gotta go do community service. And you just start thinking, 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 and that's an adventure. And then the first time you have that thought, it's dangerous. The second time, then it becomes more real, and you're like, you know, I'm gonna just give this up and go do that. So my advice is to only focus on the the task and what you get out of it in the process and we could we could talk very deeply about the process versus outcome but we don't have the time uh, on that but the tldr is to focus on the process and not how you're gonna feel about the outcome because when you do that then you get in the dangerous territory and this is one that gets a lot of people um distractions like social media or so many other forms of entertainment. How do you find the drive to ignore distractions and keep pushing? Oh man, that's a great, that's great. Because, because, you know, being a millennial, I, I have one foot in the past and one foot in the present. So, so I remember what life was like when you could like go someplace and there were no push notifications and now it doesn't seem like oh, you can't do it. And the reality is, look, man, I'm human like everyone else. I don't want to paint a picture like like I have this iron focus, right? And that's really important for you to understand that I am flawed like everyone else. The difference is I have figured out how to work around my flaws. And the way I do that is when I need to, when I really need to do work, the phone goes on airplane mode all the other windows get shut out and and i stay in them and i stay focused i get done what i do because because i don't have the luxury of being able to work away from my computer so i had to figure out uh, one of two things and i figured out both one how to shut out distractions and two well if i'm going to be distracted i need to i need to figure out how to get paid for it like, like i spend way too much time on social media to have not figured out a way to get paid for it and so now it's not so much a distraction. Yeah, it, you know, it can be it can distract me from building something longer lasting, which requires my focus. And that's where that first strategy comes in, where I'll, I sit down and I go, OK, uh, I'll do 30 minutes of work. And you can be really you, you, you'll surprise yourself what you can do with just 30 minutes of work of no distraction, because a lot of people, especially I, I'd say anyone under the age of like 25, doesn't know what it's like to work without a distraction around. And that's kind of weird thinking about it. I know, I know you're closer to my age, TK, but like that's when you think about it, if all you've grown up with are cell phones in this wireless era, you have no idea what it's like to do deep focused work. You, you just never seen it. So, so try it out. And, and the first tiptoe into that deep end is to put the phone on airplane mode and shut out all the browsers and you'll be like wow what's going on and then you just do it over reward yourself they, they the pomodoro technique they, they say where well, you get a, a timer and set it 
for 20 or 30 minutes and there's that old school i mean you can do the same thing with your phone while it's on airplane mode you can set your timer but yeah taking blocks of time out where there are no distractions because you, you don't want to just you know hop in cold turkey cut it all out and like go to a cabin in the woods you'll probably you'll lose your mind no you want to start slowly block out block, block out 15 minutes of no distraction 20 minutes then up to 30 and you'd be surprised if you can do an hour just work 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 and you'll be amazed at what can be produced with just 30 minutes to an hour of not having to check your push notifications man i love it let me give you one last one because i think you're the perfect the perfect guy for this one and that is how can i manage being an athlete and a businessman uh so so my my gut answer is to make those two as closely related as possible right and what i mean by that if you can figure out how to use your your athleticism or our, as a way to promote your business endeavors uh that i mean that's a huge win and and you know I don't, I don't, you know, know what level of athlete you are, but like if you're in the NCAA, you know, they, they got some restrictions. But fortunately, uh, uh, some states are starting to win that game. But if you're in that in that position where they haven't won that game yet, I feel for you. And the next thing I will suggest is is you just need to get rid of anything else that doesn't matter. Because realistically, if you if you're in that position, here's the cool thing about about being an athlete. And a business person, right? What do we? What do we? Well, the the question is, how do you manage that? The well, first, what else are you managing? If you if you you know if you have a family, they're gonna support, right? If, you know what I mean, like a family that's like your kids and immediate. If you don't, no distraction. If you're worried about having a social life, ah, the social the social life will find you. There's that old quote, you know, like a man's never lost, you know, money, you know, women chasing money, but lost women chasing or money chasing women, right? But, but that, that applies like to a social life as well. If you're really on your purpose and about your business and you're performing well, those things will find you and you'll, you'll have your choice to cut them off. But what it sounds like to me, and I hope I'm not answering the wrong question, so that's why I'm giving two answers. Uh, one is dealing with distraction. Anything that is not business or not sport, don't worry about it. It's going to find you and you'll be able to re-engage in it, especially if you're doing really well, whenever you want to. If it's the latter, if it's the, the, the first problem where it's uh, business takes me this way, athlete sports takes me that way, and I can't find the intersection, the intersection always exists, right? It, it always exists, and sometimes it's as simple as taking full control over your business or of your sport, uh, you, your ability to kind of market and promote yourself, uh, barring that that caveat about NCAA level uh, that we spoke of. And when you have control over the, mar the marketing on either end, then you can let them overlay. I had a very similar issue when I fought, like, like almost identical. And I had to explain to my manager, like, you know, you don't understand this because he didn't want me to speak about sobriety. Uh, he thought it would be a, be a, a, um, a deterrent to people who are interested in signing me. And I said, no, 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 no. Trust my intuition here. This is a good thing anyway. And it was. It, it was one of the things that, that tilted Rock Nation in the favor of signing me when I fought because they knew I would, they wouldn't have to worry about me as a drinker. And I, I was a person they could put places if they wanted to put me, if they wanted to do that, because here's a guy talking about sobriety as an athlete. There's something you don't see every day. Ah, right. Let's, that's a worry. We don't have to worry about this guy's not going to be a drunk mess create a story and and there, there are tons of examples generally speaking if you're trying to do something constructive in your life there are other areas you can overlay that and use it to build up and support other things now now if your business is something crazy like like pimping or something i got nothing for you right but if you're trying to do something positive and constructive your business is useful you have you have tons of outlets if that's if that problem is one of your problems at Lattimore, man, you are among the best in the business when it comes to answering impromptu questions with uh, <laughs> such substance and depth, man. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us, brother. Thank you so much, man. And no problem. I appreciate you having me. Uh, just so happy to be part of this, man. First digital uh, speech went way better than I thought it would. <laughs>
And, and man, for the for the people that want to follow you, where, where can they find more of you? I am Ed Lattimore, just Ed Lattimore, the way it's spelled right there on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and my website is spelled just like that. One word, though, edlattimore.com. All right. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you. All right, everybody. So the next session that was scheduled is a talk on how to be exceptional with William King Hollis. He had an emergency. He won't be able to make it. So I'm going to give you TK's two cents on how to be exceptional. And then after that, we're going to go into our panel with Dr. Robin Moriarty, Magat Wade, Stephen A. Hart, and Chris Coleman. So you don't want to miss. So stay tuned. So let me give you my three tips right now on how to be exceptional. Number one, greatness isn't mandatory. I remember hearing NBA champion, NBA all-star, future NBA Hall of Famer LeBron James talk about when he played for the Olympic basketball team. He said before that time, he thought he had a really good practice routine down. He thought he knew what it meant to work really hard, and he felt very confident in his approach as being a, an effective approach, as being the approach of a champion. But when he played on the Olympic team, every morning practice would start somewhere, let's say around like eight in the morning, right? Kobe Bryant would be up no later than five. He would be at the gym, 100 free throws with his left, 100 free throws with his right, 100 three-pointers with the right, 100 three-pointers with the left hand, figure eight drills, working on his game. A few hours before practice even started, LeBron saw that and he said he realized that he could be doing so much more than he had previously imagined in order to become great. And then he began to get up earlier. He began to hit the weight room like Kobe. He began to practice extra drills like Kobe. And he was able to unlock a new level of greatness in himself. The most important thing to understand about greatness is that it's not about asking what is required. It's about asking what is not required, but is also still valuable. You know, a lot of times when people are in school, they're in class and the teacher's talking about something, everybody wants to know, is this gonna be on the test? Is this required? Will I, will I get in trouble if I don't know this? Or we go to our jobs and they tell us what's required of us. Okay, uh, will I get in trouble if I don't do this? Is this required? And if you just limit your thinking to what's required, to what you're going to not get in trouble for avoiding, you'll never be able to go beyond the good expectations of others. If you want to be exceptional at anything in life, don't just focus on what's mandatory. Focus on what's so valuable that nobody can make it into a rule that I'm required to follow. I remember back in the day when I used to work at a restaurant, I wanted to be a bartender at the restaurant, but they weren't hiring for that. And if they were gonna hire, they definitely wouldn't have hired me because I was the lowest on the totem pole. I was a new server and there were other people there that had seniority and more value than me. But I knew that I wanted to get behind that bar. That's the job that I wanted to have. And so I asked myself, what's something I can do to get the competitive edge? What's something that I can do to be so valuable that I can be able to get into that position? So one of the things I noticed is that Behind the bar, the garbage would fill up really fast, especially in the evenings. And, you know, the bartenders would always ask the servers, hey, can somebody help? And, and the servers didn't want to do it because everybody's so busy. And it always came down to a manager making somebody do it. And, and whoever the manager picked on and made do it, they would be so upset about it. Right. So I, I saw that and I said, you know what? That's going to be my job. I'm going to be the garbage man. I'm going to be the guy who makes sure that he gets behind that bar, takes out the garbage without a manager having to ask him to do it. I'm gonna be the best in the restaurant at taking out the garbage. So the first few times I did it, the bartenders were like, hey man, thanks TK, we appreciate that, team player, right? The next few times I did it, man, you the man, you the man, bro. And I kept on doing it, I kept on doing it to the point where none of the other servers even bothered with it. They, they just assumed it was my job. A few months down the road, an opening came up. One of the bartenders left and a position was opening. The first person the managers came to was me. You want that job? I said, yeah, why y'all ask me? Because you were a team player, because you chose to do the difficult things that no one else was willing to do. If you want the biggest rewards in life, this doesn't just apply to money. 
This applies to working at a restaurant. This applies to working in any kind of business. It, it, it applies to the work that you do in your classroom, the work that you do in your sports teams, the work that you do with your family. The greatest rewards in life come to those who look for valuable things to do and without waiting on anybody to make it into a requirement, they step up and they take the lead. Being a leader isn't about your title. It isn't about your position. It's about your willingness to step up and do the things that other people are too comfortable to do or too afraid to do. My second thing, how to be exceptional. Take responsibility for creating change in your life. When a lot of people hear that word responsibility, they cringe. You're blaming me. When you tell me that it's my responsibility, you're blaming me. You're saying it's my fault. But we have to make a distinction here. And I owe this distinction to the late and great Wayne Dyer, who said responsibility is not blame. Responsibility is not it's your fault. Responsibility is the willingness to respond to any situation with ability. It's about recognizing that even though I may not be to blame for the situation that I'm in, no one is ever going to care about my dreams, my desires, my goals, my problems, and my life more than I will. So if I wanna see change, I'm gonna be the one to take leadership on it and step up and make it happen. Zig Ziglar used the following analogy. He says, there was a man who was given a set of directions to a party. He takes off and he's driving to the party and he gets turned around. This was the days before GPS. So he stops at a gas station and he says, hey, can you help me find my way? And the guy said to him, you know, it looks like somebody gave you the wrong directions. You took a left here and you need to take a right there. So just go back and take a right where you thought you should have took a left. Now, was it that guy's fault that he was given a wrong set of directions? Not at all. He sincerely believed the information that somebody gave him. Nobody's fault. It was just the wrong set of directions. However, now that he is in a position where he has the knowledge to get himself on the right road and do something about his situation, it is his responsibility to act on that knowledge. When you look at the areas of your life where you wanna grow and where you need to see change, don't waste your time playing the blame game. Just take responsibility for being the one to create the results that matter most to you. My last thing, be non-negotiable about the right things. I just heard Dave Ramsey this past weekend talk about a time in his career when he could have benefited from having more money. He was just starting off and somebody said to him, hey, I've got a big radio spot for you, but you know, you mentioned Jesus a lot. You talk about your Christian values a lot. You know, maybe don't talk about that. And he said he had a choice to make. He can just stop talking about his Christian values and focus on making money, or he can focus on making money within the context of his priorities and his principles. And he decided that he would turn down an opportunity in order to do what he believed to be the right thing. And that decision more than just about anything else he had done is a decision that paid off, not only in terms of finances, but in terms of relationships with people who trusted him and empowered him to do greater things because they saw the character. Never compromise your character in order to achieve success. Be willing to compromise on strategies and approaches, but never compromise on the values that cause you to bring dignity to your work. Those are TK's two cents on how to be exceptional. And now it is time to talk about how to be the CEO of your own life. So I'm excited about this panel. We've got four great guests, people that I've had the chance to interview personally, people that I've had the chance to talk to personally. I've had the chance to look at the work that they've done in the real world, and they are all dedicated to making people's lives better. Magat Wade, one of the most successful entrepreneurs I know, and she is a true and legit human being. It's hard to find a label for her because she's had her hands in so many different projects. She's built so many products and services and helped so many people. And I'm so excited for you to hear from her. She's done such significant work in helping people both in Africa and America understand the economic principles that lead to financial literacy and self-sufficiency. We've got brother Stephen A. Hart, who is a marketing expert, a business owner, and a successful thought leader. Stephen A. Hart is the host of the Trailblazers FM podcast. And we did an episode together where he talked about why black success stories matter. And Stephen has introduced, has interviewed so many top talents around the world, so many great achievers, and is just brimming with the life lessons and insights that I'm glad you get a chance to hear from today. And Dr. Robin Moriarty, 
the author of What Game Are You Playing? And she talks a lot about the importance of approaching life with a sense of play and with a sense of possibility and making sure that you're not wasting your energy in life, being good at things that you don't even care about and that aren't even taking you in the direction that you want to be. How do you define your own game? And how do you play according to rules that you are contributing to in some way? And then we have my brother, Chris Coleman. Chris Coleman is a children's author with a powerful story. Once upon a time, this brother was homeless. He was also a comic book fan and he would read these books and he would say, you know, I don't see me in these stories. I don't see people that look like me and the children that I'm gonna have in these stories. And instead of just complaining about it or waiting for somebody to do something about it, the brother stepped up and he wrote himself into the story and is a powerful example of how we can give ourselves permission to write ourselves into the narrative. I welcome my panel going to talk with us about how to be the CEO of your own life. How's everybody doing? Doing great. great. <laughs> it's good to see you all. It's good to see you all. All right. So we have a lot of questions from our viewers. And there's no way we're gonna have enough time to get through them all, but I, I wanna lead with one of my own. And my question for you, and we'll start with you, Chris. The question is, what's the worst piece of advice you've ever received and why? Uh, that's a good one. Uh, worst piece of advice I've ever received um, is to kind of like conform to uh, whatever the role, whatever the country, uh, is the job is, um, and, and granted, in some instances that does make sense. But I used to perform like trade offers a lot. Um, so when I went to uh, get a job at a bank, they took me to off. Um, an older woman, she was the hiring manager, and she said, "You know, you should come on, you have a higher chance to get a job." Um, and so I did it because I wanted to, you know, work at a professional place. I wanted to take that next level. My uh, journey um, to in my career, and um, when I realized that you know people technically later in life hired me to uh, for me for the personality I bring, for the skills that I have, for the talents that I have, um, and all of that is what they actually want. That's when I realized, hey, just always be yourself. Um, mm. No matter what situation, come in, be yourself, be authentically you. Maybe that situation won't work out. Maybe that uh, opportunity isn't for you. But because you don't get that, you now have time to get something else. And so that's definitely been something that I've learned um, and that I've been able to benefit from. Powerful. Magat Wade, what's the worst piece of advice you've ever received and why? Oh, let me see. Um... <laughs> I remember back in business school in France and uh, my, my professors, because that's how we call them in business school, a professor, not a teacher. But it was this advice of don't speak with your hands. See, the French are very, it was, I, I was raised and educated in France. So the French are very, you know, like, so they did not like the idea of me speaking with my hands. And I, I can't, if I speak without my hands, it's almost like I can't speak. Because my, my hands are like, um, it's an extension of my, of my tongue, right? So it was one of the worst advices I've ever gotten in my whole entire life. This idea that you speak with like your, your hands the right night by your side and you control them. And so, and for the longest time, I tried so hard to do what they said. And I was just like one of the worst speaker ever that you've ever seen, you know, when I was trying to do my, um, you know, cl uh, class project or whatever. And as it turns out, uh, I never knew back then in the middle of years that, you know, I would be later, you know, going around the world, giving talks and speeches and everything. And, you know, people, but I never, I never followed the advice they gave me. Eventually when I just threw it to the wind, that's when things started working out for me um, from that standpoint. So when I go, I, I always remember that. And it's, all, it's also usually one of my reminders uh, to not necessarily listen to the experts. You know, the experts can be really, really wrong. So just go with what feels right to you. And I think when you go with what feels right to you, you are then being yourself. And when you're being yourself, others get just to feel the authentic you. And that's really all it takes. And so maybe for somebody else, it's about not moving your hands. But if it is them, it will work. So in this case, that's what it was. Very powerful. 
Dr. Robin Moriarty, what's the worst piece of advice you've ever received and why? So I have a little bit of a, I have an advantage because I heard the question. So I actually got to think for a second. Um, anytime anyone says, you know what you should do, dot, dot, dot. Anytime anybody starts a sentence with, you know what you should do, dot, dot, dot. You should go for this job. You should study this thing. You should get a career in this. You should get married, you should have kids, you should buy a house, you should whatever. Anytime anybody says that, I automatically lean back because I go, wait, <laughs> you're telling me what you want to do, but you're not telling me what I should do. And so immediately I push back. So worst advice I ever got is every single time someone says, you know what you should do. And I'll give an example about the book because when I was writing the book, it was the first book I did. When I was writing the book and I was talking with the publisher, um, they were like, well, if you're going to write a book and it's going to be successful, okay, successful, their term of what successful is, not my term of what successful is. If it's going to be successful, then you're going to have to have a website and a consulting practice and a YouTube channel and a this and a that and the other thing. And I immediately just kind of went, whoa, that's what you want me to do. That's what you are telling me I should do. But let's spend a little more time talking about what I define as success and what I want to be doing. And then let's start from there. And so anytime someone says, you know what you should do, give yourself some pause there and say, wait, what do I really want to do? And shift the conversation and, and, you know, kind of go from a different starting point instead of letting them set the terms of the conversation and the terms of what they think you should be doing, which isn't necessarily what you want to be doing. We're coming right out of the gate with some major dynamite here. Brother Stephen A. Hart. <laughs> <laughs> What's the worst piece of advice you've ever received and why? I'm still geeking on what Dr. Robin just shared. Um, you know, I I remember when I was putting the idea of trailblazers.fm down on paper and going to launch some nearly five years ago. And there was no platform, there's no podcast geared at serving black professionals, entrepreneurs, leaders exclusively. And there's so many people, and we talked, I think Magat talked about um, not listening to the experts, but sometimes it's even the people that are closest to you who will say, I don't think that's really the direction you want to go in. And those are the ones that you really have to, you know, debate, hey, do I listen to this person who is near and dear to me, or do I follow my passion? Do I follow my God-given purpose and my heart? Um, I had to make that decision because the advice that the advice was no, you know, focus on everyone, right? Serve everyone. And I had to listen to my heart. I had to listen to that call that God placed on my heart to say, no, this is what I want you to do. I want you to focus on black professionals, entrepreneurs, and leaders. And 200 episodes later, here we are. Now everyone thinks, oh, Trailblazers is a great platform. Imagine if I didn't listen to that. Um, call on my heart. Um, we wouldn't be here today in in the in the way in which um, you know Trailblazers has succeeded. Thank you all for uh, sharing your thoughts on that one. This next question, we're going to now go to questions from our audience, and I like this first one because it, it kind of gives you an opportunity to kind of delve into your background a little bit. But the people want to know what makes you entrepreneurial. What makes you entrepreneurial? This time we'll we'll start with you, Dr. Moriarty. Oh wow! Okay, so so I think what makes me entrepreneurial, I'm so I love to learn, and I love to learn anything, and there's nothing more exciting to me than going up the learning curve of something new and creating something. You know, saying, okay, let's write a book, let's study this job. I've lived on four continents, traveled to 60 something countries, you know, let's learn a new culture. Let's create something new in a context that hasn't happened before. And so I think for me, it comes from this like drive and energy and curiosity and creativity, um, but that's fundamentally grounded in this desire to keep learning new stuff. And when you're constantly learning new things, you start to see how there are connections across things. And it's kind of like what Ed Lattimore was talking earlier about the athletics and the, and the business side of things. You start seeing spaces and intersections where things can connect and where creativity can happen and where that innovation and entrepreneurialism can really sort of grow. 
So for me, it has to do with that, you know, foundation of wanting to learn and the curiosity that goes behind that and having experiences and lots of different kinds of areas that are, are great for fermenting growth and new ideas and, and innovation. And, you know, it's just creativity for me. Very awesome. My God, what makes you entrepreneurial? I think, I think for me, it's just like my general attitude in life, which uh, resolve, revolves around this simple idea of uh, criticize by creating. If something sucks, anything, and it can be anything, and we all know all day long, it doesn't matter how much gratitude we we can put out to the world and i also try to practice gratitude because there are a lot of great things in the world that, that are well every day um but uh surely enough there are so many things wherever you turn that are wrong it, it's it's you know so my attitude is always about criticized by creating the only valid form of uh, criticism uh of critiquing it of criticizing sorry is to offer alternatives they don't have to be right uh they don't have to be right on but you know when you think that way, I think it just um, gets you in a space where you're totally thinking about solutions and uh, you're also thinking about outside of the box. And so for me, it's just been uh, the mantra by which I live my life. It's, uh, it's from Michelangelo's, but uh, that's, that's what my parents raised us with. So criticize by creating. If it sucks, get up, do something about it. Stephen A. Hart, what makes you entrepreneurial? You know, I'm from Jamaica and I'm going to tell you that it's in my DNA, right? Um, I'm from a country, a culture, a family that bleeds entrepreneurship and creativity. Uh, you know, I, I recently learned my grandmother uh, had probably five different jobs, you know, as an entrepreneur back in the backwoods of Jamaica in, in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And um and so, you know, and my dad has run a business for 40 something years. So I have only seen that. And, um, and, and beyond that, uh, I have a, a creative gene. I got touched on, you know, seeing the problem and wanting to find a solution. And I just don't think, even though I, I have thrived in some roles in corporate, it requires me to bring my entrepreneurial self, even if, if that be the case, I cannot be boxed in. And I have to allow my creative uh, gene to to go where it wants to go to find that solution to that problem. Excellent. Chris Coleman, what makes you entrepreneurial? Uh, I must say uh, just being authentically myself is kind of like the same as the previous answer. Uh, but I think most times we think of entrepreneurs in a sense of like, Elon Musk or uh, Mark Zuckerberg, somebody that's created something that we've never seen before. But a lot of reality entrepreneurs are people providing a service or um, an experience that we've come to know and understand and that we kind of can't live with, uh, life without. And so I think for me as a creative, um, writing books and creating, producing content and videos, of course I, I'm trying to be creative and, and innovative, but the first thing that I think of is, you know, what's something that I would like? What's something that I think I could fully give to the world um, that I will enjoy creating and, and enjoy making? Um, because as Stephen just said, you know, you can work a corporate job. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but for some people, you, you get a little restless. You get a little bored. Um, so what is this something that I can enjoy making every single day or enjoy turning to? When I get off my job, maybe, um, and I'm working from six to two on this thing, like what's going to keep me energized every day um, to get to that level? So for me, it's just waking up, being authentically me, and then taking the ideas that I have and, and putting them into action. Excellent. All right. Next question is, what can I do? Everyone's expectations from me are different from what I want to do. I'm going to go with Magat Wade on this one. I'll repeat the question. What can I do if everyone's expectations for me are different from what I want to do? Um, I don't know what your life circumstances are, your family circumstances are, but I have found it to actually 
be at some point you got to stand up for yourself um you got to do what makes sense to you uh you have to remind, remember that each person has their lives right and uh, you came here to live your life as well and at some point you have to develop the courage to say listen you have your life and you can do whatever with it i maybe you didn't do all the things you wanted to do with it but that was your choice um this is my life i only get one of these and i'm going to try to make it to make it matter damn it so um I usually, to hell with what other people want me to do. Um, actually, it's usually a good sign when it's a, it's a sign of who really cares about you. Um, because people who care about you usually will be trying to help you find out what is your path and um, help you with, you know, developing that path. So for me, you just have to have a boldness and a courage. And at some point, that's what it takes. Um, do you have the courage to stand up for yourself and to just say, you've had your life, you've had your life, this is my life, and I will do what it takes. Um, and just have faith in that. Just have faith in that and have faith in yourself. And um, that's that's what I've done. And that's the only, that's the only answer I could, I could provide to anybody else because that's what worked for me. That's excellent. So, uh, Chris Coleman, I, I want to stick with this question, but I want to get you to touch on the, the, the a personal dimension of it. Do you have any any uh, story from your own personal life where maybe someone did have different expectations for you? Uh, it's a it's a yes and no. Um, once again, similar to Steve and my family are full of entrepreneurs. Uh, my grandparents uh, back in the 50s and 60s created a private elementary school in Philly um, that at the time was the longest K through eight all black uh, private school in the country. Um, so that's kind of always been the way that I was raised uh, was to think entrepreneurially. However, within that, it was still security and safety, right? So it was still go to college. It was still try to you know get a, a good job uh, until my senior year of college, I told my parents, like, hey, I am learning a skill set that I think will exceed my uh, salary or any job that I could get coming out of college. And here's the proof. I'm making money off of this. Um, and here's how, here's the plan I have to further, you know, my development and then further uh, the funds that I can bring in. So I, I would definitely say if, if you are in a similar situation, um, at least try to create a plan um, and take that first that first smallest possible step where you can say like hey parents or hey grandparents or hey friends or whatever um, like here's my plan um, i know these are the things you have in mind but here's my plan and here are some of the things that i've done and here are some of the results i think a lot of people can't really argue with results in some regards um but there's proof in the pudding so if you are seeing results, if you are at least taking the steps, um, it doesn't have to be anything grand. It could just be putting time in every day uh, to getting better at what it, whatever it is that you want to pursue. Thank you, Chris. Stephen A., I imagine one of the reasons why this is so hard is because people who have different expectations might criticize us, make fun of us, or even get mad at us. I love to hear your thoughts on how do you deal with the backlash of, of following your heart when that conflicts with what other people want from you? So, you know, TK, I have actually, through the process of experience, um, gone about this a little bit differently, right? So I encourage my students to reverse engineer this process. Before you even tell your family what it is that you have um, in your heart, um, get clear on that for yourself, right? So get clear on your vision, get clear on your why. Um, and your why isn't tied to the monetary, right? Uh, my why is centered on my impact, on the legacy I hope to leave for my two crumb snatchers, um, on my purpose um, and, and, and what's driving me, right? So, um, I could even take you back and, and kind of talk for a second, TK. I shared this when we, we last spoke. My first business was purely based on the pursuit of the monetary. I was focused on the material things that I could attain. Um, that business failed miserably. Um, I lost several million dollars. Three weeks into getting married, I went from being a millionaire to being six figures in debt in the space of about six weeks. 
um, you know, that took me from a place of almost buying a, a million dollar brownstone for my new bride to saying, honey, can you pay the rent for what then became about 18 months? And luckily, I am blessed to still be married to that amazing woman 12 years later, and we are no longer in debt, praise God. But I share this story about entrepreneurship because while we all focus on the reward, entrepreneurship has the ability to be brutal. So you need to make it plain. You need to be clear on your why. What are you doing? Um, and it must absolutely be beyond the money, right? So... Um, for me, you know, we talked about creating, right? Creating is a big part of me. Uh, despite the, the mistakes of the past, I still have a heart to create. So when I'm creating this podcast or I'm creating, you know, any of the other million ideas that um, live in my heart right now and are part of my vision, the exercise I have done for myself and I, I train my students to do is to first sit down and give thought to, what does 30 years out from now look like, right? Put that down on paper. You know, when you're in a, a rocking chair or on a beach chair, hopefully I'm on a beach chair somewhere on the north coast of Jamaica in 30 years, um, what would I have wanted to look back and have achieved with my life? Remove all the obstacles. Don't worry about what you don't have um, to start seeing that vision through. Just put that vision on paper. Then you begin to reverse engineer to 10 years. And I call that your big, hairy, audacious goals. Uh, look at that 30 year goal, reverse engineer it to 10. And then every year I'm working towards this 10 year vision for my life. When I have that down on people, it don't matter whether it's my wife, my parents, my kids, I don't care what anyone else can't see for me. I have it clear and I have it documented as to what God put on my heart and exactly what I am working through to, to see that through. And I think it helps you um, as the entrepreneur to be clear when you have that on paper, you can't edit the idea in your head, but if you have it on paper, you can run with it and you can shut down all the noise that will come trying to tell you not to do uh, what God tell you to go put <laughs> into the world, right? Thank you so much for, for being transparent and telling that story too. It's, uh, that, that can't be easy to say. Uh, went from a million to, to close to the bottom. That's a powerful testimony. Dr. Moriarty, the question on the table is, what can I do if everyone's expectations for me are different from what I want to do? The element that I like to hear you address is, what if those people are your parents and they seem to have some positional authority over your life and they can cancel what you want to do? Yeah. So this one, I, you know, and I loved what my God said and wow, like that's really brave and really strong. And Chris, what you said also, and, and Stephen, and I was just thinking, gosh, but this can be really scary, <laughs> especially when it's the people who are closest to you and who are supporting you, who are the ones who are kind of really pushing back against what you want to do. And, um, when I think about it, I think about this philosopher named Khalil Gibran, who wrote a book called The Prophet. And there's a chapter in there called On Children. And it's basically the idea that children come from you, not through you. And that your role is to help them become who they're supposed to be. Not who you are, not who you want them to be, not who you wish you were, but who they're supposed to be. And I always think about that with my friendships, with other relationships in my life and even with myself of just this whole idea of how do I help myself and how do I help other people in my life uh, become who they're supposed to be. And I think about it also in terms of how do I find support of people who are helping me become who I want to be. And sometimes that's your parents and sometimes maybe it's not your parents. Um, and I know in my case, I've had you know, sort of moments in life where maybe my parents were more and less supportive of me and some of the crazy ideas and things that I wanted to do that they thought were maybe a little too scary, a little too out there and out of their desire to protect me, they wanted to kind of hold me back, right? And so I think that, um, you know, depending on your own personal situation, I think there's some great advice that the other panelists have already offered. But the thing that I would add is how do you find other people, mentors, role models, peers, you know, sort of other people in your life 
who can support you in ways that maybe your parents aren't ready to support you yet, or you know, you kind of need to balance out the support that you're getting from your parents with support that you're getting from other people who are helping you grow into that person that, that you need to be and becoming who you are. And so I do think it's a bit of a negotiation process. Um, you know, and it, and it can be really scary. And I don't want to I don't want to minimize that part because whenever you're doing something against the expectations of others, you know, your own brain kind of freaks out a little bit. You can get really nervous and uncomfortable and insecure. And so having other people who support you and other people who are in your life encouraging you and sort of cheering you on can help give you some of that courage um, that you might need to 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 get to be able to go forward with the way that you want to be living your life and what you want to be doing. So, you know, if your parents aren't totally supportive, what I would say is go find some other people who are. So you've got some counterbalances and, you know, great ideas again that Stephen mentioned that Chris and that Magat have all mentioned of how do you sort of incorporate tools to help get your parents more comfortable and even more importantly, get other people who are already naturally supportive of you engaged to give you that courage and that and that um, that motivation to keep going forward with what you need to do. Excellent. Thank you so much, all of you. So as a as a strategy for getting more questions in, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to divide them up. I'm going to have two of you answer a question and that way I can I can squeeze in more. So for Stephen A and Chris, my question for you is going to be is there a right age to start a business? Is 15 too young and is 16 too old? That's going to be your question. Uh, for Dr. Moriarty and Magat, your question is going to be, how can I start my entrepreneurial career? If I don't know where to begin, how can I start my entrepreneurial career? All right, so we'll come back to you. We're going to begin with Stephen A. Hart. Is there a right age to start a business? Is 15 too young and is 60 too old? There's no right age. The right age is right now. Uh, I have a 10 year old daughter who is absolutely introverted, counter to what I thought uh, would be required to be entrepreneurial. One of my first guests on the podcast is somebody who worked with a small business administration, lives in my local area. Um, after serving her time in the administration, um, decided to homeschool three kids. She asked if uh, she was putting together a kids entrepreneurial fair and asked if my daughter wanted to take part. I said, she probably doesn't sign her up anyway. Um, this was, she was eight years old. She had to come up with an idea for a business, figure out what she was gonna do, um, how she was gonna borrow money to get supplies, um, she ended up creating at eight years old, uh, a rock art business, um, and took part in a business fair and sold $110 worth of rocks, um, in a day. Uh, so I, I think the, 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 the challenge is figuring out, you know, what's the, what's the, the, the point at which you can, uh, identify a, a problem, have a solution that really ties to something you enjoy doing. In the case of my daughter, she loves art. Um, and so, you know, we thought, hey, you know, uh, we could create different types of rock art that would fit in someone's garden, or, you know, we ended up creating games because she loves games, she loves space. Um, and so we ended up creating uh, tic-tac-toe sets out of, of rock art and, and stuff that was practical and useful but there's no right age to start a business. You just need to get going right right away. And on the flip side, you know, maybe Chris can speak to the, the older side of it, but. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I agree. I don't think there's a, you're too young or too old. Uh, obviously younger people do have the ability to utilize technology uh, and get things up a lot quicker. You know, there's a whole section on TikTok where people are saying, these are the items that I want. Or you can literally just browse through and see like what's trending, what's, um, what's, what are people buying? And you can set up a Shopify page for free. You can connect it to Arbolo or any other um, outsourced or drop shipping company and make money in 24 hours uh, without owning any product. All you need is a phone, 
an internet connection. So on that side, for the younger people, I definitely think it's, hey, what is it that you're already using? Are you on Instagram? Are you on TikTok? Are you on Twitch? Um, and just look at what people are, are, are asking for or looking for um, if you don't have an idea that you want to engage with or want to put out to the world just yet. For the older people, um, I definitely think it may be a little more challenging if you haven't been an entrepreneur before, but I think uh, it's the same thing. The internet is the ultimate equalizer. I know um, with my mom, I've years ago, I used to tell her, hey mom, like you have a master's degree in education, you're always counseling people, um, and she's working for amazing universities. Um, outside of that, she does own real estate, but I was like, hey, like you should create a course on this information that these schools hire you to do. And so like due to the pandemic, you know, she's no longer going in to teach. And she was like, okay, now's the perfect time. Six years later, but she was learning how to use Zoom. You know, she's learning these different web platforms like Kajabi and um, any other learning platform. She's taken the time to learn how to film herself uh, because everything technically is on YouTube and Google and it's, most of it is free. So I think it's one understanding uh, what it is, what skill sets that you have, because you do have one thing that others don't, is experience uh, in more years on this planet. Um, and then looking at what's the easiest barrier to entry for you. Uh, if you aren't very technical, uh, maybe start doing a, a course isn't the thing. Maybe it's selling on e-commerce. Um, if you are a teacher, you want to you know, put out more content or you want to uh, take advantage of what's happening in life. Maybe you utilize your home and create um, in-home in learning workshops as kids are no longer able to go to school. So it's just taking advantage of the opportunity, um, being creative, thinking outside the box, um, and then just uh, going for it, jumping all in. And you're, you may fail, you may hit some bumps, uh, but that's life and as long as you keep going, eventually something will definitely Thank you so much. All right, so Dr. Moriarty, how can I start my entrepreneurial career? So the first thing that I was thinking is, what's the problem you wanna solve? Find something that is a problem that people are struggling with, frustrated with, need, need something to be resolved. Right. So I would start there with, you know, what's a problem that you can solve and that you can solve in a way that other people aren't already solving it. Um, technology is a great equalizer. There are a lot of different ways you can incorporate technology into those ideas. But what are sort of problems that need to be solved? Things that people get frustrated with. I love the example, TK, that you shared a little earlier about taking the garbage out behind the bar at the restaurant. You know, what's a what's a problem that needs to be solved in a way that that you can solve it, that other people aren't doing it? And then I think when, when you're starting an idea, when you've got sort of that problem you wanna solve and a way to solve it, getting used to the idea that you're gonna iterate and do things a few times, a few ways, and some of them are gonna work and some of them aren't gonna work. And don't try to force something that doesn't work. Don't try to make something that's not working work. Keep trying and you'll find the way that it does work. So it's sort of that fail fast, fail often until you figure out how it's going to work best. And then I go back a little bit to what I said before, make sure you find the kinds of support that you need um, to help get your ideas off the ground and, and get them moving. And whether that's the plethora of online resources you can have or you know different friends and family members or mentors that can help you get the idea off the ground, be looking for those as well. Uh, and then finally, you've got to understand the core economics of whatever you're doing. There are a lot of great, great ideas out there, but the difference between a hobby and a business is, is, is important and it has to do with the economics behind the idea. So finding the problem that you can solve in a way other people haven't, iterating to be able to fail fast and you know find the way that it works the best, finding the right kind of support and understanding the fundamental economics of it to mirror the, the four steps that I would want to definitely have in mind. Magat, Magat, Magat Wade. So I'll just you walk start? you through yeah, I'll just walk you through my uh, my first company. Right now, I'm building my third company. So I'm just going to walk you through my first company. 
Um, it, uh, it, it was a beverage company. And uh, so I had decided that I was really upset with, you know, um, how come I had gone back to a trip back home and I discovered that the hibiscus drink I used to grow up with, people mostly don't want to drink it anymore. They think, oh, if you made it, you have to drink Coke, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, whatever. So I was really upset about it. So, but as I told you, remember, criticize by creating. If you're upset that this juice doesn't is has been squeezed out, you have to bring it back. So I, it was my thing. I was just like, okay, I'm gonna bring the juice back. So what's the first step is I have to make it. So basically, my plan was, okay, um, I'm gonna go to my local um, grocery stores and try to sell them the juice. Except I had no juice. I had enough. I. I, it was just in my head. I wanted to sell them something that was in my head. So how do I go from this here to having the juice on the shelves as it happened later? Well, I guess Google is your best friend, <laughs> you know? So what I did is I'm like, okay, the, the, the juice recipe, I, I kind of knew it pretty well because, you know, I kind of grew up with it. Um, but I, and then as an adult, as a young adult, you know, I was also making it sometimes. But then, you know, I wanted the fancy kind that my grandma had been making before, but she was no longer alive back then. So I called back home and I started talking to some of my aunts and basically between all of my aunts, I kind of got the recipe back kind of more or less together, the, the one I really liked that had the pineapple in it and, you know, all of that stuff along with the hibiscus. And so, okay, there I was. I had the form, I had the, the formula. See, in, in the business world, the, in the professional world, they would say, oh, you got your formulation. But no, I got my recipe. You know, I got the recipe from the family, from um, the, my, my, my aunt. And then, um, so I literally um, was on the phone. My aunt is like, you need to get a stainless steel pot and then, you know, I got all the ingredients. I knew exactly how much I needed per ingredient to make things. And I was just got on to making it in my kitchen, you know, making it, trying it, of course, had some miserable failures, things that didn't really taste right, all of that stuff. And then um, got to the right juice, you know, like now I made it, it looks really, it tastes really good. It's awesome. And then, you know, but then I'm like, okay, how do I bottle this thing properly? And then that's when I go on to, um, at the same time, also, I have been on phone calls with some, actually not on phone calls, back then I was going directly to the stores and kind of meeting with the store people, you know, saying, hey, I have this idea and I have no idea, you know, how to go about it, but uh, what would it take to have my juices on your shelf? And then they would start talking to me about, well, it has to be pasteurized and then I had to learn the difference between flash pasteurization and, um, you know, like uh, versus it not being pasteurized, what was the difference? Why do they want it pasteurized? Or or why would somebody not want uh, to drink a pasteurized juice? All of that stuff I learned. But most importantly, so I went back home, I'm like, okay, they're saying that they need this to be pasteurized. I knew that I wanted to have glass bottles. That's just me, that's my taste. I didn't like plastic bottles. So I would bottle the juice in, and then I had learned from Google that the way that you pasteurize something, um, the good old way, is you get a big bucket of water, uh, dump tons of ice cube in it to the point it gets like really icy water. And then um, what you do is here, what, what way we were making the juice is you brew, basically hibiscus is a tea. So you brew, you brew it uh, for five minutes in boiling water. Then you strain it, um, you know, and you add all of your other ingredients, you know, all of the pineapple juice and all that stuff. And then you put the sugar, whatever. And then uh, you st when it's still hot, like that hot, you put it into the glass bottle and then you close it. Once you, as soon as you do that, dump it in the cold icy um, water, a bu bucket of water. And then from there, when you take it back out, when you open it, you should hear that pluck. And that pluck tells you the pasteurization process happened. And I was like, whoa, this is so cool. So that's kind of how I made my first juices. And then um, I, before I was able to do that, I had to freeze the juices. Uh, before I take them to a store until I learn how to pasteurize. So all of this stuff, you know, I just have to learn the hard way. But eventually I'm like, I'm learning that, okay, I, pastor I pasteurize everything, it sounds fine. But all of a sudden I'm seeing that, wait a second, wait a minute. When I, went, when I put these on my, on my kitchen counter, because I was doing all of this in my kitchen as like a little mad scientist. When I put them on the, in, the, in the counter, the ones that I would sell later, what I'm finding, I'm finding that actually things are settling at the bottom and it's looking slimy almost. There was nothing bad uh, because it was pasteurized properly. So it's not like there was germs or anything, but 
the the look of it was disgusting the taste of it i mean it just looked disgusting it was not looking like something you really wanted to so i had to be like what the heck is going on and then eventually you know i did some more research i'm finding out about separation and you're finding that you know it's true you let something sit and things start to separate oh what is that so and how do i make sure it doesn't separate all types of things and eventually i'm learning through the process um I went back to the store, this one store where I had somebody who was really willing to help me. And I'm just like, what is going on? And so this person started talking to me about, he's like, do you have a food scientist helping you? I'm like, no, what is that? Well, a food scientist is in charge, you know, there are the people who basically can help you turn a, a, a recipe, a domestic recipe into something that can actually be shelf stable. What does shelf stable mean? Well, shelf stable means that, you know, when you want for your product to look like when you made it for it to look the same way a year, a year later or two years later, that's what they do. So just, you know, following the trail, one thing after another, this is how eventually I ended up from that stage to my juices all over the country at all the Whole Foods in the world, the Wegmans and all of that, um, the ex-chairman of Pepsi on our board, the guy who founded Odwa, all of that happened. And the first step was me making a phone call and making sure that I had my recipe right from my aunts, for my aunts. And then from there, it was one thing after another and just walk, working through the kinks, working through the kinks. And that's just how it is. So I, all of this long story short to say, don't be, uh, daunted by the task ahead. Don't be just, there is going to be a way. You have to trust that there is a way ahead. So just start with a step you you understand most. And then from there, you things will start to, to, to pop up. So don't, don't be too crazy about, you know, um, trying to figure it all out right away. You, you just have to realize you're going to be making tons of mistakes. Uh, but if you start talking to people, see, that's the key. Start talking to people, even people that you think know nothing about this, because chances are somebody somewhere is going to know more than you. That's for sure. So, and just follow it, follow it and go meet people, tell them the truth. Uh, when you're, when you're, when you're young, you have an advantage that everybody wants to support you. Everyone wants to help you. Everybody wants to be part of it. I received all of these samples for free. No one was charging me for these samples. Eventually, I was able to make real product from the samples. I got the samples for free, but I was able to sell the product. And so start out with some little cash like that. So all I'm saying is jump in, you figure it out if you stay awake, obviously. Thank you so much. Robert Moriarty, McGott Wayne, Chris Palmer, Stephen A. Hart. We, we are at time, but these have been wonderful insights. I wish we could go for another hour. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, for everyone that is tuning in, be sure to check out the feedback survey in the chat box. It just takes uh, one to two minutes to fill out. We ask that you fill that out. Also, please keep in mind that this was just the beginning. Tomorrow, we tonight was Get Inspired. Tomorrow is Get Creative. Then on Wednesday, it's Get Paid. And then on Thursday, it's Get Started. So be sure to tune in tomorrow. We've got some great sessions for you. Uh, one, we've got Austin Wintry, who is an award-winning composer who has scored over 50 films. We also have Afua Richardson, who is an American comic book illustrator, who is known for her work with Lovecraft Country and with the Black Panther. And then we also have um, Kevin Lieber, who is the creator of the Vsauce 2 YouTube channel. And Kevin is really interesting in that he weaves together insights from history, philosophy, technology, and science to talk about the complexities of the human experience. He's got over 600 million views on YouTube and also has a podcast called The Create Unknown where he talks to different creatives around the world. So tomorrow is going to be the day to tune in if you want to hear creative insights from actual creators on how to get your ideas off the ground and how to just be better at generating great ideas. Thank you all for tuning in. We hope you stay inspired and we hope to see you tomorrow night.